Do you solemnly swear affirm that your testimony in these proceedings will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you, God. I do. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you, Honor. Good afternoon, ma'am. If you please tell the members of the jury your name. Yes, my name is Dr. Valerie Rao. My last name is spelled R-A-O. And how are you employed? I'm the District 4 Medical Examiner. And what, uh, what comprises District 4? Uh, District 4, we have three counties, Duval, Clay, and Nassau. And are you the Chief Medical Examiner in your district? Yes, I am. How long have you been a medical examiner in total? 32 years. And are you also a licensed physician and surgeon? Yes. And how long have you been so licensed in the state of Florida? Since 1981. Can you summarize for the members of the jury, please, your educational and professional background? Yes, I got my degree in medicine in 1971, after which I went to London. I spent a year and a half doing pathology at two hospitals, one St. Helier's Hospital in South London and the other St. Andrew's Hospital in East London, after which I came to the U.S. and I did residency five years totally, two years doing clinical pathology at Berkshire Medical Center, Pittsfield, Massachusetts, two years doing anatomic pathology in Albany Medical Center, Albany, New York, one year doing forensic pathology in Baltimore for the state of Maryland. I'm board certified in anatomic, clinical, and forensic pathology. I then um, spent a year in Tucson, Arizona, where I did medical examiner work. Um, sorry. I was medical examiner for a year. One year as medical examiner. After which I went to um, Miami, where I, I was an associate medical examiner for a total of 19 years. I then took a chief position in District 5, where I was there for three years. I went to the University of Missouri in Columbia, where I was associate professor for two years, and then came to Jacksonville, where I've been here for about seven years. And just briefly, what are your duties as a medical examiner? Um, in the state of Florida, we're required to investigate sudden, unexpected, unnatural death. Um, and ultimately to sign the death certificate, the cause and manner of death. What is meant by the term pathology? Pathology is the study of disease in the human body. And what is meant by forensic pathology? And so in forensic pathology, what uh, it comes under the umbrella where, where the sudden, unexpected, unnatural death cases come under the um, forensic pathologist. And have you ever been qualified as an expert in the courts of the state of Florida in the field of forensic pathology? Yes. Approximately how many times? Hundreds of times. Do you also have experience examining injuries to living people? Yes. And explain what that experience is. Yes. So when I was in Miami, uh, where I was an associate medical examiner, I um, had the opportunity to work there at the Rape Treatment Center for 18 years, where I saw several thousand uh, living patients examination and treatment of these uh, victims. And what types of injuries uh, would you see when examining those victims? Okay, some of the patients that came were also physically assaulted. So there were injuries that come under the category of blunt force trauma. There were patients that were stabbed, so that's sharp force injury. Some of the patients were strangled but did not die. So we saw this gamut of cases in living patients. And what are blunt force injuries? So blunt force, um, the term is to distinguish it from sharp force, meaning that the instrument that's being used, um, a, for example, a bat would qualify as a blunt weapon, um, a stick, um, if I was to bump myself as I came in here um, on the corner of this table, I would suffer blunt injury if it was severe enough to cause injury. Whereas the sharp force is injury that is caused by a sharp weapon, a knife, a, a bottle that is broken and then the sharp edge used to inflict trauma. So this is the difference between sharp force and blunt force trauma. Within blunt force trauma, are there different types of blunt force trauma? Yes. And what are those? So the, um, the first part of it, let's, let's look at the progression of severity. A bruise, um, we're talking about a small bruise is where the skin is intact and the blood vessels under the skin are injured and they bleed under the skin and get what you <coughs> know as a bruise. The skin is intact. Then you have a scrape. 
um, where the skin is compromised and it's, um, you know, for example, a rug burn would qualify as an abrasion. Then you have the lacerations where not only the skin is um, um, torn, but the underlying tissue is also torn, exposed to the outside. And depending on the severity of the laceration, you will get varying degrees of um, bleeding and trauma. All right. Are bruises also known as or referred to in your field as contusions? Yes. All right. And then scrapes is the same as a laceration? Abrasion. I'm sorry, abrasion. Yes. And then there's lacerations? Yes. Okay. Which is basically, laceration is a tearing of tissue. All right. Have you ever been qualified in the courts of the state of Florida as an expert in the area of conducting rape examinations and all manner of injuries associated with rape victims? Yes. And again, approximately how many times? Hundreds of times. During your uh, tenure as the medical examiner in Miami, did you also examine other uh, categories or sets of living, living victims? Yes. And explain what you mean by that. So, um, for example, somebody alleging police brutality, the medical examiner, we just um, were housed directly across a very large hospital in Miami, Jackson Memorial Hospital. So the police would ask if we could go and examine um, to see if the allegations were actually borne out by the trauma. So we would go across the street, we would photograph, we would put out a report, and those reports come under consultations. Also child abuse cases, especially if, if the clinical uh, people thought that the child was going to die, they would ask us to come and take the photographs and uh, do the interpretation. So we basically practiced forensic medicine, not really forensic pathology, where you're only looking at dead people. You know, at this time I would tender Dr. Rao as an expert in the area of pathology and forensic pathology. I don't think that's necessary under the current case law in this state. Mm -hmm. so. she, she, she'll be able to testify in those areas. Thank you, Your Honor. Were you asked to examine some evidence in the state of Florida versus George Zimmerman? Yes. And specifically, what were you provided uh, in regards to that case? Okay. So I was given um, a, whole, a whole series of um, things that I asked for the um, whatever is available because I'd like to do the consult having as much as possible in the database before I um, formulated an opinion. So what I received was a reenactment of the incident involving the fatal shooting. This was recorded um, on the 27th of February 2012 I got a set of 36 photographs taken of Mr. Zimmerman documenting the clothing, the injuries, the medical records from the Altamont Family Practice Clinic. Um, and of course there were two records from this clinic. One was on the 27th of February and the other one was on the 9th of March 2012. I got a DVD labeled Sanford PD Lobby and others. It showed the vehicle going to the police department and Mr. Zimmerman um, being taken by the police um, into the department to be booked. Um, a DVD labeled medical examiner report and photographs and this included the medical examiner report, the body diagrams, the autopsy photographs, 26 autopsy photographs were taken, the toxicology report um, and then um, a report that uh, states um, two individuals were involved in a physical altercation in the yard and one of them um, fired a handgun and the decedent um, fell to the ground. And the other items in the same folder were the medical examiner autopsy report, the toxicology report. So this is what I received. Did you also receive two photographs of the defendant at the scene the night of the event? Yes. And when you said reenactment, when you referred to the reenactment, was that a, a, an interview where he conducted a walkthrough and, and led investigators through the scene and explained to them what happened? Yes. After reviewing all of those items, in, in terms of severity, how would you classify the injuries to the defendant's head? They were not life-threatening. Uh, they were very insignificant. Uh, they did not require um, any sutures to be applied uh, to Mr. Zimmerman. Um, so, as I will refer to them, insignificant injuries. Did you observe any lacerations to the back of the defendant's head? Yes. How many? Two. 
And were those lacerations depicted in the photographs that you reviewed? Yes, they were, they, they were, there was bleeding, so I was not able to look at them after they were cleaned, because subsequently when he went to the Altamont Clinic, they were um, covered by band-aids. And were you also um, provided the reports from the Altamont Family Springs Clinic uh, describing the injuries as they were viewed by a physician's assistant the next morning? Yes. Right. Yara, would you assist me with the lights? Dr. Rao, let me show you first, state 79. Was that one of the photographs from the scene that you were provided? Yes. And state 76, was that a photograph from the scene you were provided? Yes. Let me show you states 57, uh, where you also provided that photograph. Yes. All right. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? Yes, ma'am. Dr. Rao, let me give you this pointer. Um, let me just press that button. Yeah. If you would explain for the members of the jury where the lacerations are located um, that you observed and that were referred to in the uh, family clinic report. Okay, so we have one small injury right there and one injury right there, where the blood is streaming from. So um, these were the two lacerations. All right, in the um, Altamont Family Clinic report, were you also provided with the measurements of each of those lacerations? Yes. And are either of those lacerations life-threatening? No. Why not? Because it, 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 was, it was so um, minor that the uh, individual who examined and treated Mr. Zimmerman told him that the sutures were not required, so she put a band-aid on each of them, and that was the extent of the treatment. All right. Are there also some contusions, or a contusion, on the back of the defendant's head? Yes. And can you show the members of the jury where that is in the photograph? Right there. And is that a life-threatening injury? No. Why not? Well, um, you know, the reason I asked for everything was I then looked at the entire case file and when he walked um, from the police car to the police department to be booked, he was not incapacitated in any way. He was um, very alert and walking, um, you know, in pace with the officers. Are the injuries that you observed to the back of the defendant's head consistent with his head having made contact with a concrete surface? Yes. And why do you say that? So, you know, I've looked at um, the other areas that were photographed, and they have a, a sort of a pattern um, that were punctuate, meaning that there were little um, areas which came into contact with a rough surface. But um, so looking at the concrete area, again, the reenactment that, um, that I was given, it's consistent with his head having come into contact with that rough surface. And are the injuries on the back of the defendant's head consistent with one strike against a concrete surface? Yes. And why do you say that? Because if you, if you hit the head one time, it is consistent with having gotten those two injuries at that, that one time because it's an area where it is protruding because the head is protruding because the head is a round um, surface and so that one impact could result in the two lacerations that you see. And are the injuries you observed to the back of the defendant's head consistent with his head having been slammed repeatedly into a concrete surface? Okay, so I'm going to give you my, um, um, what I think based on the dictionary definition of slammed is. And there are two definitions from two different dictionaries. Let me object, Your Honor. Um, if she's going to define a word from a dictionary, that would be hearsay. Uh, mm. uh, Please approach.
proceed? Yes, ma'am. Dr. Well, using your definition of slamming, your common understanding of slamming, are the injuries to the back of the defendant's head consistent with having been repeatedly slammed into a concrete surface? No. Why not? Because if you look at the injuries, they're so um, minor that to me the word slam implies great force. Um, and this, the resultant injuries are not great force. What type and extent of injuries would you expect to see if the defendant's head had been repeatedly slammed into a concrete surface? So if, it, so if somebody's head is repeatedly slammed against concrete with great force, I would expect lacerations. Um, I would expect a lot of um, um, injury that would bleed profusely, that would necessitate suturing. And so I don't see that in this um, picture. All right, let me turn your attention to States 47. Will you also provide that photograph? Yes. And what injuries uh, did you observe in, in this photograph, States 47, if you would just describe those for the jury? Okay, so there is a small abrasion on the bridge of the nose right there. It's a very small um, little punctate at the tip of the nose. Can you circle that with your laser, if you would, yes. or just indicate it? Right there Okay. and right there. And are any injuries in this photograph life-threatening? No. Why not? Um, he has no loss of consciousness whatsoever. It, you know, he didn't have to go to the hospital. He went to a, um, a clinic. Were there any contusions or abrasions that you noted in this photograph? Yes. All right, can you, sh again, show, just show us where those are? Yes. Right there and right there. How would you characterize or classify the contusions, the severity of the contusions or abrasions to his face? Very small. Could all of the injuries that you observe in that photograph have come from a single punch or a single blow? Yes. And why do you say that? Okay, so if you look at the distribution of where the injury um, is, uh, and let's think that I'm the one inflicting the blow, if I was to punch myself right above here, I would get the injury on the nose and on the few contusions on the forehead. So one blow would um, be able to inflict these injuries. Are the injuries that you observe to the defendant's face consistent with the defendant having been beaten a dozen times or more in the face? Uh, you know, if he was beaten repeatedly but with no um, resulting trauma on the face, then yes, but if the force is such that you get trauma, then only one time. Did you observe contusions to both sides of the defendant's head? On the sides, yes. 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 All right, let me show you state 75. Was that a photograph you were provided? Yes. And could you uh, circle the area of contusion that you observed in state 75? So one has to disregard this dried blood because it is coming from the laceration on the back of the head that I had demonstrated earlier. So we are looking at a contusion here. And there are very, very fine punctate abrasions that you need to have a close-up photograph to really see them. And again, explain for the jury or define for the jury what's a punctate abrasion. Okay, punctate means like a little speck, like a spot. All right. Are any of the injuries depicted in State 75 life-threatening? No. And in terms of severity, how would you classify uh, the contusions or abrasions in this photograph? We had um, very small injuries. Could all the injuries exhibited in State 75 have come from a single blow? Yes. One impact against concrete, yes. Let me show you state 73. Was that also a photograph you were provided? Yes. And what injuries are depicted in state 73? Okay, so here again you have to disregard the dried blood that's coming from the laceration to the back of the head. And so you can see very, very faint, again, punctate, um, small abrasions. Are any of those abrasions life-threatening? No. And how would you classify the abrasions uh, depicted in State 73? Very insignificant. Could 
those abrasions depicted in that photograph have come from a single blow? Single impact, yes. Right. And why do you say that? Because the surface area on the side, if you look at my head, and I was to bang, get, you know, um, on the concrete, I could get all those injuries from one impact. You also mentioned uh, that you viewed video clips of the defendant getting out of a police car and walking through the police station that evening. What did his appearance uh, in that video demonstrate to you regarding his injuries? Well, he um, was not incapacitated in any way. He walked on his own power and he was also um, conversing with the police officers uh, during this, um, this reenactment. All right. Thank you, Doctor. Judge, that's all I have. Okay, thank you, Cross. Yes, thank you, Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. Um, you got your appointment to your present position because Ms. Corey, the prosecutor in this case, appointed you, correct? Correct. Okay, so she's sort of your boss? Not really, no. Uh, but, but it was because of her. I mean, she appointed you to this position, right? Um, she, she actually sent my name up to the governor. So if you want to call that an appointment, well then, so be it. Well, why don't we do this? I'm going to read a letter to you. Tell me if you consider this appointment. Pursuant to section 406.15, I hereby appoint... I this. I'll approach and let her review it, maybe. I just have it electronically. It's okay. I could explain. Okay. If, if so I could, let me, if let I me ask the question. Okay. Is what I'm looking at a letter signed by Ms. Corey where she says that she appoints you to that position, yes or no? That was the interim position. I can't say yes or no because I have to explain to you. Well, I'll That's tell you what, I'll the, walk you through it. One at a time. I'll walk you through it, okay. okay? Okay. There was a yes to that. She appointed you to the interim position? Yes. And you had another position as a medical examiner in the state of Florida too, correct? Yes. That was with the 5th district? Yes. But you were not reappointed to that position by the governor, were you? I did not seek reappointment. Okay. It was, that was stabled. Because, I'm sorry? It was stable. I did not seek reappointment. And that was because of some of the problems that existed in your administration in that office, was it Correct. Not? Okay. Yet yeah, you got the job with Ms. Corey's office, or actually in the same district where she prosecutes, correct? She's a state, yes, yes. How much of your work is on behalf of the state attorney's office in that district? Well, the medical examiner really does not work for the state attorney. We are separate, but most of the time we are called by the state. However, the defense can call us. You could call me on this particular trial, and I would be here for you, just like I'm here for the prosecution. I totally get that. My question was, how much of your work is on behalf of the state attorney's office in Duval County? All the homicides. Okay. Uh, all the work, right? You only deal with homicides, right? No, no. We do suicides. We do traffic accidents. We do drug overdoses. We do natural death where there is no physician to sign the death certificate. So it's, a, it's other work. Homicides are a very small percentage of our cases. I, I'm sorry. Let me clear it up. Um, how much of the work that you do involve crime matters and I'm presuming in that question that all of your crime matters are dealing with the Duval County State Attorney's Office. So how much of what you do is related to criminal activities? Okay, so we have a total of 1,165 cases, autopsies. Okay. And out of that, we have probably 110 homicides. So that is the proportion. Okay. And in all of that work, you work with these very prosecutors, correct? That is correct. I mean, these are the homicide prosecutors for that that division or that office, right? And we have a whole a whole series of state attorneys, yes. Okay. But they are they are in that office. So, they called you to look at this, correct? Correct. Did they have you look at anything having to do with Trayvon Martin? No. No. Well, they whatsoever. sent me the autopsy report, so I saw that. Yes. But you're not here to tell us anything about no. Trayvon Martin. You're just talking about George Zimmerman. That's correct. And if I get it right, it's your position that's at least consistent that George Zimmerman may have only received as little as three, did you call it, what term did you smashing? Or Sorry? What, slamming. Three slamming into cement. I didn't, I didn't use the word slamming. I'm sorry, I thought it was your word. No, it's, I got that from the reenactment. What word would you use to describe what happened to the head that you say hit cement? Impact. Impact. So it's your position that there are at least three impacts between that head and cement? Yes. Okay. Concrete. 
concrete. However, and you said it's sort of consistent, so I'm gonna walk you through some of that. I'm not gonna use pictures right now, let's just chat a little bit about it, okay? I think you used the suggestion that if you hit yourself in the nose that it could be all one shot, correct? One blow, correct. Okay. You're not certainly just suggesting that it was only one blow, correct? No, but okay. consistent with. And, and you say consistent with to minimize the number of shots that it could possibly be, correct? Not minimize, but if you gave me another scenario, I could look at that scenario and you, see if it's consistent. Let me give you this scenario. He gets hit in the nose like this, just like that, but it does not go up here. So here's the first shot, and here's the second shot. How many is that? Two. Consistent with that picture? It could be, yes. Is it any more consistent, or any less consistent than the fact that there was one shot? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get it. I'm sorry. You said earlier that those injuries could be consistent with one shot. Correct. And now I think you may have said it could be consistent with two shots. If, if the way it's depicted like you have depicted, yes. But, well, you don't, just so we're clear, you don't know how Mrs. Zimmerman was hit by Mr. Martin, correct? Correct. So you're saying it's consistent with one, potentially. Yes? Yes. And it also is consistent with two, correct? If the way it was portrayed, yes. Which you don't know. Correct. So could you just say, is it consistent with two as well? It could be, yes. Okay. And it could be consistent with one. Yes. Okay. And it actually could be consistent with another couple of hits with a palm or, as you said, another couple of hits with a fist that just didn't leave visible injuries. Yes. So you're certainly not telling this jury that Trayvon Martin only hit Mr. Zimmerman in the face one time. I'm just telling you what the injuries are and what it's consistent with. Okay. Did you notice in those pictures the cuts on Mr. Martin's knuckle on his left hand, both on the ring finger and a slight one on the pinky? Okay, those are not cuts, those are abrasions. So, because cut suggests sharp force injury, and they are actually where the skin is rubbed off on Trayvon Martin's hand, correct? That was a yes? You did notice them? Yes. Okay. Are those consistent with striking somebody? Yes. So we have some injuries, the only injuries, as a matter of fact, besides the gunshot wound are two injuries on his knuckles, correct? Correct. Curious, since you've had a chance to look at the autopsy, were there any other injuries on Trayvon Martin at all? No. Any bruising injury? No. Any laceration injuries? No. Any punctate injuries? No. So you know for a fact that Trayvon Martin's head or any part of his body was not in contact with cement, correct? Well, I didn't see any injuries. You can have a contact, but without producing trauma that's visible, so... As I, Mr. Zimmerman could have, correct? Correct. A dozen of them even, right? Sorry? A dozen even, correct? A dozen what? Other impacts. But let's get more specific. We've now talked about the potential of two, you would even admit, let me ask you this. Is there a possibility that with a swat or a hit or a fingernail or something that even this abrasion on his nose could have been a third? Anything is possible. Well, you're here as an expert, yes. so I want you to give us your opinion. Is that, is that possible based upon your level of knowledge? Okay, so I will um, ask this. Um, I know I'm not supposed to ask you questions, Go but ahead. you know. Um, so then the next um, issue would be that each of the punctate marks on his head could have been caused by, you know, uh, a fingernail scratch. Or, I mean, that would be the next um, question posed. And we're looking at the preponderance of the evidence and the opinion rendered thereby. So, you know, we can continue this. Um, um, Let's move know. on. Yeah. Let's move on. Yes. Okay. Um, but we'll spend a moment on the nose. Um, so, you saw on Mrs. Zimmerman's right side there was a protrusion to his nose, correct? What does that mean? I, I, I don't know. I don't I'm know using the mean. word protrusion. It was the first photograph. Let's go back and see if we can take a quick look at this. You see, um, you have, well, we both have one. 
You have a pointer, correct? Yes, I do. You see that spot right there? That's the abrasion, yes. No, right below that little swelling spot right there. Do you see that? I don't see a spot, but I see swelling, yes. Swelling, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, that swelling to an uninitiated view actually all looks like there's a bone over there, doesn't it? But we know it's not correct. There is a bone, yes. Well, but the, the swelling is not movement of bone, is it? Or is it? I don't follow that. I'm Let me sorry. just ask you to explain then. What is that swelling on the right side of the nose from? Okay, so that's trauma injury. Okay. And what happens is the body reacts to it by rushing lymph fluid to it and all this other stuff that sort of tries to take care of the site of injury or trauma? Yes. And that recedes pretty quickly, doesn't it? Oh, it depends on the extent of trauma. Yes. Well, and we know in this case, you acknowledge the trauma and the swelling there, right? Yes. And you notice in the pictures after it that the swelling has receded, correct? Yes. So it does recede after a few hours? Uh, depending on the severity. Here it was not severe, so the, it, the swelling rapidly declined. And you know that there was blood coming out of the nose as he was standing up, correct? Correct. Where do you think that that was bleeding from? From inside his nose. And where would that go if I'm laying on, if he's laying on his back? Where would what go? I'm sorry. The blood. Well, it depends. If you are alive, you would. Um, if it went back in your throat, you would cough it out. Or swallow it. Well, I don't know. Well, I mean, it's going back down your throat, isn't it? Yeah, you cough it out. You, I don't know if you would swallow it, but maybe that's a good suggestion. Okay. Um, so, we have the nose injury, one. We have the potential of the injury up here that you identified could be a second shot, correct? It's possible, yes. Well, I mean, if I showed you a picture, let's just say that we did, in fact, have a video. And the video showed a smash to the head, to the nose here, and then sort of an overhand. Let's say that it was an overhand shot. You had a video, or let's say an eyewitness, who saw an overhand shot. Would that be consistent, the overhand shot with that injury up there? Oh, um, the, the small bruise? Yeah, right up there. It, it's possible, yeah. Well, is it consistent? It could be. Okay. <laughs> On the back here, you testified that you believe that all this was created or consistent to have been created with just one strike on the concrete or cement? Okay, so all of this, I don't follow that. I see two lacerations and a small bruise. Okay, you see this laceration? Yeah. You but see it, this laceration. Okay, so, you know, it's being actually camouflaged by the dried blood and the dripping of the blood, but once cleaned, um, the nurse that examined him said one was 0.5 centimeters and the other one was 2.0 centimeters, which is um, very small. And so, you know, it, after it's cleaned and you look at the photographs, you don't see what you, your suggestion may be that there are a whole series of injuries back there. All right, well, I'm just going to ask a couple of questions about all this. You said, I think, in direct examination that it, this is consistent with one strike upon cement, correct? Concrete, correct. Concrete. Um, now, you're not, su you're not suggesting to some reasonable degree of medical certainty that there was only one strike here, correct? No. So, this could, according to where this was, let's, let's identify a term. I'm going to use the term crown, and we know the crown of the head normally is up here. Correct. But I'm going to use crown in a different term for the next few questions, okay? And that means the point that hits the cement. Can we use that term for just a couple of questions? Do you know what I mean by that? Do I do, I do what? Sorry. Rather than the crown, which would be the first thing to hit the ceiling if you stand straight up, I'm going to say that let's just say that this is where the impact on the cement is, okay? Okay. Now, the head could impact just there. Correct? And just hit there, right? Uh, well, if, he's, if he, the impact is on the side. Absolutely. Because we don't actually know what part of his head con contacted the cement, do we? We know that there are two injuries that resulted from the impact. Right. That, that's a given, right? And, and they could be separate, right? 
except that it's in close proximity. Yes. Right. So I could hit a knuckle right there, or I could hit two knuckles at a time, correct? So it's according to how it happens, right? What the physics is of how it happens? Um, I'm not very good in physics, but you know, we're not talking about knuckles, we're talking about one surface area. So I can explain just simply, I, I don't know about what the physics of this injury is. Then let's get away from physics and talk this way. Let's just say that he was hit where, see this line right here? See that line? Do you see yeah. me making a line? You mean the area? No, 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 the line I'm making with the laser. Okay. Okay. Let's just say that only that on this side came in contact with the cement. Is that possible? Oh, yes. Okay. It's possible. And if that were true, that only the point on this side came in contact with the cement, that only that injury would occur or could occur that way, correct? It's possible. And now, if we look at the other side, the same line, that side, let's just say that only this side of the skull was in contact with the cement, then that injury would happen, correct? That's possible too. Two separate injuries, correct? It's possible, yes. You're not suggesting it's any more likely one or two, are you? So we'd be doing the preponderance of the evidence, and the preponderance would suggest that one impact um, is more plausible than the way the head is shaped to have two separate impacts. But, like, you know, if you say that that was something that was eyewitnessed, then yes. Well, what if somebody put their hand, let's say, on the side of a skull, then smashed this way? Would that... Not ...was an injury just on one side of the skull, correct? It could. And you see this bruising right here, do you not? See that swelling? No, that's the shape of his head, I think. So in your opinion, you've come to a medical conclusion that that crowning over there is natural? Um, yes, that is the parietal area of the scalp, yes. I'm curious why it doesn't seem to show itself as protruded on this side. Because sometimes the shapes of heads are different, you know, we're not all symmetrical. And if you look, there is no discoloration there. Um, so that may be an anatomic um, variation. So, um, right here, do you see any bruising or any discoloration at all in that photograph? Okay, I don't see bruising, but I see small, very tiny, punctate marks. Um, you know, and the other thing is, um, the photograph you're looking at, the hair is so short that if there was something there, we would be able to see it really well. And, we, you know, I have to strain to look and to see what um, you are suggesting, so I don't, I, I, I can't answer that question. I just want to be clear because the jury will have not even these photographs, but they will have much better photographs to, to view and to study, but as I do that I want to point out to, to you to see if we can focus you. Is it your testimony that this, this coloring here, this darkening in this way, is a natural occurrence on his skull and not evidence of a bruising, yes I or no? I don't see a bruise there, but I did see, because I also have very good photographs, which you can see clearer, there are very fine punctate abrasions. Okay. Let's speak a moment for what you do see then, the punctate of bruising. No, not bruising, abrasions. Uh, punctate abrasions, abrasions, I'm sorry. Is that the abrasions that you see over here? Well, again, the photograph is so poor that, um, you know, I have to look at my own photographs. Then let's take a moment. Okay. Can I have some lights, Your Honor? And I'm going to leave this up because it would be easiest for the jury, but let's coordinate. We might, uh, doctor, the photographs you did look at and these photographs. May I approach the witness? Yes, Are you um, reviewing the photographs that you had? Okay, so I will show you my pictures that I have. I printed them from the computer. Um, so this is the one side. And this is the, um, I think, the photograph that you're showing. And you can see very fine little abrasions there. Well, 
let's identify that you're now looking at a copy of what is State's Exhibit 73. And uh, I think we're going to have to do this a bit more formal. So if I have a moment, Your Honor, I'm just going to have to get the actual 8 by 10 out of evidence. try and do, Doctor, is to identify your photographs and connect them to the exhibits in. Did you get an entire um, picture packet from the State Attorney's Office to review? No, I, I got a disc and I, I printed out some of them because it was taking me so long on the computer, so I just printed a few of them. Then we'll do it this way in case you don't have them all. May I uh, examine her from this location because I've got exhibits that we do not have on. Is the jury able to see in here? Yes, you may do so. Let me show you what's in um, as State's Exhibit 69. Your Honor, these are in already, so I'm just going to identify them for the jury and have her testify from it. Um, and let me ask you if you can look. First of all, let's identify. This is, in fact, State's Exhibit 69. Just yes. Say, okay. Yes. You want to hold it for a second? Thank you. And I'm going to question you about that if you look at the photograph. Is it your testimony that in Exhibit 69 there is no bruising above Mr. Zimmerman's left ear. I just see the punctate vibrations. I don't see bruising. And there are some, some marks on the head which are nevi, which are moles, brown moles. So you are seeing that also like there and there. So um, to point out, two inches above his left ear, this area of lightening and darkening you do not perceive as swelling? Um, no, I don't think that's swelling. I just think that's the shape of the head. But um, it's a very, very funny angle. And so there's distortion in that photograph. And I cannot tell you that that's bruising. I'm sorry. Okay. And similar in States 57, so we're clear for the jury. In 57, sort of a back view, I ask you to focus first at the area we just looked at, which is about two inches above Mrs. Zimmerman's um, left ear. Are you suggesting that, again, that is not any type of swelling or bruising, but rather just the natural contour of the, his head? Okay. So, if, okay, so if you are suggesting that that's a swelling, then the bruise should be so marked that I should not have trouble looking and identifying that as a bruise. So um, I, can, I can't comment on that. Is that a yes or a no? You say that that is bruising or not? No, just I, above. no, I can't see the bruise there. If that's what you're, this part is what you're talking about, yeah, I don't, I can't say that. Let me show you State's Exhibit 70 that's in evidence, which is a picture of the 
right side of Mr. Zimmerman's scalp, correct? Correct. And pointing your attention to the uh, laceration, bruising, cut, uh, use your term, not mine, um, just in the middle of that picture. Yes, he has a bruise on the right side, plus he has the punctate abrasions. Okay. Yes. The bruise on the right side, how do you think that was, how did that occur? Oh, impact against concrete could give you that and the other abrasions. Now on number 70, let's look further back about two inches towards the back of his skull and tell me what you see there. Okay. Um, are you referring to the small? Yes, thing? I am. Okay, that is a small bruise. It's pink, discolored. And is it your testimony to, well, how did that occur? I impact could give you that. And could that have been a different impact? Possible, yes. It's, it so it's is con possible, it's correct? Yes. Uh, matter of fact, how much of a distance do you think there are between those two points of impact? Well, I think it's not just the distance, but also one has to look at the curvature of the head when you are, um, you know, and when I'm giving you an opinion, I'm not only looking at the distance between the two contusions, but I'm also looking at the the contour of the head. That's what I was curious about. So let's talk about that. The contour of the head is somewhat. Um, Sphere-like, is it not? Um, oval, yes. Oval. So if you have two points on a sphere, or an oval, correct? Correct. Um, it's convex, is it not, the skull? Yes. So if you have two points, two inches apart, why is it not a continuous bruise or a scarring all the way across? Why would you have two separate ones? Okay, so it's not scarring. Scarring is a different... I, I, I apologize for the misuse of the term. Why is it not one long, if it came from one contact, why is it not one long injury? Okay, because the force, uh, force applied to one area because of the um, contour may not be equivalent to the force in the other area. And so in one, one site, the force may be sufficient to cause a contusion, but not, it's not you know, we're not like um, computers, you know, it's not, you do something and you expect this result. We are dealing with um, a different configuration of the head, so I, I don't think that follows. It's, it's a nice uh, thing to be able to say, but I can't say that. Yeah. Certainly it could have been two separate injuries, correct? It's possible, yes. Okay. Um, and looking at States 69, I want you to pay some attention to what seems to be a view of the Mrs. Zimmerman's skull, correct? Scalp, yes. Scalp. That's right, his skull will be underneath. Right? Correct. Um, and I want you to pay attention to the top of the picture and see if you can tell us what you believe that protrusion to be, my term, not yours. Okay, so on the other side, we're, we are actually looking at, at a photograph of the left side of the head and the top of the head, and we actually are getting a, a view on the right side of that bruise that we talked about. So uh, that's the same bruise. Do you see the swelling is my question? Yes. Okay. So there's swelling and we, okay, you're suggesting, and I would like you to be clear about this for the jury's consideration, that in uh, exhibit number 69, you do acknowledge swelling that seems to be to the right side of the midline of the scalp, correct? Correct, but you got the bruise, which, you know, if you want to say, well, this is um, a swelling, but there is no bruising there, and if the, if the swelling was so severe that you are looking at on the left side, then we would have a significant bruise and we don't see that. Whereas there it's a small bruise, but you can see the swelling. So yeah. you can't, you can't um, separate one from the other, so it, it's together. Look at number 70, which we've talked about already, and tell the jury which bruise you believe that swelling is connected to. I think it's that one. Because you think it, the, I just want to be clear, you're thinking to the one that is behind the ear. You pointed to the one that is two inches or so behind the line of the ear. I think because that's such a distorted photograph that because you know we are able to see very well the right side. So why are we looking at a photograph of the left side and trying to draw um, that conclusion? I think that's extremely unscientific. 
and I apologize for that. Uh, but it's I want to be fault. clear about one thing. It is your testimony here today that the swelling that's on the 69 on the right side of the midline of the scalp, that is the bruising that is the same bruising as exists with what you've identified now as the bruising behind the ear line on states 70, correct? It could be, it could be, but like I said, it's very difficult for me to, you know, to give an opinion Thank on the photograph which is so distorted. Got it. Um, could it be a completely separate bruise? Which one? This one, the one on 69. Well, if it was, why are we not able to see it from the right side? Let's take a look at 71 then. Okay. And see what you see on that photograph. Okay, so this is again the punctate abrasions that I talked about. And that is the bruise that we are, we have to overlap. I think that's the and let thing. me show you, just at the very top of the crown of the head there, almost out of the top of the picture, is that not the bruise that we see, or the swelling that we see on 69? I, you know, I, I find it difficult when half the photograph is cut to give an opinion. I would like to see what the injury is before I tell you that that's the injury. So. Um, why are we looking at distortion and have photographs when we have the full side to be able to look at and to render an opinion? Well, I certainly only want to do and have you give us as good an opinion as you can. Do you have a photograph that better shows the injuries that we've now seen by looking at 69, which shows the, the swelling that seems apparent? No, I have the same, but I have just copies. Okay, but that doesn't show the swelling, does it? They're the same photographs, so how can they not show? Okay, so they're the same photographs, so how can it be different? I'm asking you, on, as you're here today, um, to tell me what picture you have of the right side of his scalp that shows or doesn't show the swelling that was apparent in States Exhibit 69. Okay, so I have the same photographs you have. Um, except mine is, um, like I said, copies. So this is the photograph that you are describing. I'm trying to find the one that's in evidence for that, if I might have a moment, you want Let me um, ask you to compare, if you would, the picture that you were just showing with State's Exhibit, and so I may identify it, 70. Do you have that one? I'm looking. Don't. Yeah. We have this back. Here. Thank you. So, the least number of contacts between scalp and cement were three, correct? Correct. And as many as how many? And that's some. That's a scenario that you posed, so you would know how many. Well, if you were to look at this from a medical perspective and try and come up with not the minimum number, but the maximum number. Give us your opinion. I told you three. That would be, that's the minimum, correct? Correct. My question is, tell us, in your professional opinion, how many it could have been as a maximum. I don't know. Why not? Because you were presenting the scenario about various um, um, you know, in possibility, so you have to tell me and I will tell you yes or no. Well, as I, as I said to you, there could be a possibility that those two bruises were, were two different ones, correct? On the, on the head, yes. Two bruises on the right side of the scalp. Correct. 
Okay, so I want you to include that. We also talked about the possibility that the two lacerations could be two different hits, correct? Correct. So I want you to include that. What other, and we talked about the nose and the forehead being two separate ones, correct? Correct. Okay, so keep going. How many other of those bruises could have occurred? Let's talk about the left side of the, of the scalp. It has been your testimony that it is consistent with just the, the least amount of one strike on the cement could have caused everything on the left side, correct? Correct. How many could it have been more than that? Uh, I don't know. You have to give me a scenario and we will say consistent or not. Okay, you got hit six times on the left side of the skull. Consistent? No. Why not? Because the, the injuries are so minor and they are patterned to some extent. So um, that would be um, that would be beyond the realm, I think, of, Four? of um, possibility. Four hits from the left? Well, if somebody is an eyewitness and says four times that uh, this injury occurred, then, then of course that's the best estimate. So, okay. you know. Okay. So let's talk about four on the left side. You consider, yes. you agree that that would be consistent with the medical evidence, correct? If it was witnessed, yes. You know. But you can't just say four times and you are not seeing the injuries to match the four impacts slamming. Listen, to my, slamming. listen to my question. Okay. Is there any medical evidence that would exclude the possibility that that skull was hit on the left side four times? That's not my opinion, but it could be. It's possible. Okay. Nothing to exclude. Nothing, sorry? Nothing to exclude that as a possibility? Um, it's possible. Okay. Now on the right side, the side where we see the two separate bruisings, we talked about that, right? Yes. Could that, and we also see the punct punctate bruising in front. Abrasions. Correct? Abrasions. Correct. Anything that would medically exclude that the right side was hit four times? It's possible. Okay. We see two of the bruises, right? And they could be separate. Right? Possible. Then we yes. see the punctate abrasions. That could be another one, right? It's possible. Then we see the swelling that you say may be connected with one of the bruises, but that could be separate, correct? I don't think so, because underlying the bruise you have the swelling. It, it's, so, um, it, it's, it's so impossible to get a bruise and a swelling and say, well, that was two different sites. Now, the swelling is separate from the bruise, yes, but they are one injury. Okay. Presuming that the bruising on, on States Exhibit 69 and 70, that the bruising that we see matches up in the jury's mind with that point of swelling, correct? You're making the premise. It does. It does. Okay. In your opinion? Well, you can see it. Okay. And the jury will, of course, make that determination, right? Correct. Okay. And um, then there could be a how many maximum times could the back of the head have been hit on the cement? Well, to me it was consistent with one, but you suggested by turning the head in different ways, it could be two, as possible. Three or four? Uh, with no injury, um, yes. If, if, you, if the head is in contact producing no injury, yes. How about the swelling below the lacerations? Did the you contusion. notice that? The contusion. Below. Right. So the contusion, yes. Could that have been a separate injury? No, it's possible. Well, if the head was hit so that just the crown hit the cement one time, <coughs> let's say his head just snapped back and it hit here, that that's, could have caused one of the lacerations, correct? Yes, but it's okay. so close to each other. It, uh, I, you know, well, that's the proximity that really kind of makes it possible. Okay. I appreciate that. So if the head was tilted one way and then smacked back so that this was the crowning point, that would be one laceration injury, correct? It's possible. And then if the head was this way, another laceration injury, correct? It's possible. And then if I was able to resist one of the toss backs of my head, I can actually keep the crown higher and that back bruising that you just identified could have occurred, right? It, it's unusual because, you know, you're talking about a flat surface. so. 
the head will have to be really contorted to be able to give you all those um, injuries from in different impacts. Change it now that it's not the cement, okay? Change it that it's here. Change um, it that um, what was hitting, that the bruise on the bottom wasn't flat, that it was against the side. Would that cause the, lacer the, the bruising down here without the lacerations? The, yes side, no. the side of what? The side of the cement. You know there was a cement sidewalk, correct? Yes. And you know that they were at the very edge of it, correct? Yes. So you know that there is, in fact, an edge of cement, correct? It's possible. The injury, is, the injury is possible, like you are huh. suggesting. Yes. Well, here's the cement. And we've been, all, we've been talking and discussing as though all the injuries are on the flat surface, right? Correct. So let's introduce now that there could have been some injuries here. You know, I object to this fact, not evidence. Hypothetical with an expert overall. It, it's possible. Okay. So the possibility is that the head being hit against the cement could easily, the two lacerations above may not have ever impacted again when the bottom bruising occurred, right? That's possible. One year as medical examiner after which I went to um, Miami, where I, I was an associate medical examiner for a total of 19 years. I then took a chief position in District 5, where I was there for three years. I went to the University of Missouri in Columbia, where I was associate professor for two years, and then came to Jacksonville, where I've been here for about seven years. And just briefly, what are your duties as a medical examiner? Um, in the state of Florida, we're required to investigate sudden, unexpected, unnatural death, um, and ultimately to sign the death certificate, the cause and manner of death. What is meant by the term pathology? Pathology is the study of disease in the human body. And what is meant by forensic pathology? And so in forensic pathology, what um, it comes under the umbrella where, where the sudden, unexpected, unnatural death cases come under the um, forensic pathologist. And have you ever been qualified as an expert in the courts of the state of Florida in the field of forensic pathology? Yes. Approximately how many times? Hundreds of times. Do you also have experience examining injuries to living people? Yes. And explain what that experience is. Yes. So when I was in Miami, uh, where I was an associate medical examiner, I um, had the opportunity to work there at the Rape Treatment Center for 18 years, where I saw several thousand uh, living patients, examination and treatment of these uh, victims. And what types of injuries? Uh, would you see when examining those victims? Okay, some of the patients that came were also physically assaulted. So there were injuries that come under the category of blunt force trauma. There were patients that were stabbed, so that's sharp force injury. Some of the patients were strangled but did not die. So we saw this gamut of cases in living patients. And what are blunt force injuries? So blunt force, um, the term is to distinguish it from sharp force, meaning that the instrument that's being used, um, a, for example, a bat would qualify as a blunt weapon, um, a stick, um, if I was to bump myself as I came in here um, on the corner of this table, I would suffer blunt injury if it was severe enough to cause Testimony in these proceedings will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. I do. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you, Honor. Good afternoon, ma'am. If you please tell the members of the jury your name. Yes, my name is Dr. Valerie Rao. My last name is spelt R-A-O. And how are you employed? I'm the District 4 Medical Examiner. And what, uh, what comprises District 4? Uh, District 4, we have three counties, Duval, Clay, and Nassau. And are you the chief medical examiner in your district? Yes, I am. How long have you been a medical examiner in total? 
32 years. And are you also a licensed physician and surgeon? Yes. And how long have you been so licensed in the state of Florida? Since 1981. Can you summarize for the members of the jury, please, your educational and professional background? Yes, I got my degree in medicine in 1971, after which I went to London. I spent a year and a half doing pathology at two hospitals, one St. Helier's Hospital in South London and the other St. Andrew's Hospital in East London, after which I came to the U.S. and I did residency five years totally, two years doing clinical pathology at Berkshire Medical Center, Pittsfield, Massachusetts, two years doing anatomic pathology in Albany Medical Center, Albany, New York, one year doing forensic pathology in Baltimore for the state of Maryland. I'm board certified in anatomic, clinical, and forensic pathology. I then um, spent a year in Tucson, Arizona, where I did medical examiner work. Um, sorry. I was medical examiner for a year. All abuse cases, especially if, if the clinical uh, people thought that the child was going to die, they would ask us to come and take the photographs and uh, do the interpretation. So we basically practiced forensic medicine, not really forensic pathology, where you're only looking at dead people. Now, at this time, I would tender Dr. Rao as an expert in the area of pathology and forensic pathology. I don't think that's necessary under the current case law in this state. Mm -hmm. so. She should be able to testify in those areas. Thank you, Your Honor. Were you asked to examine some evidence in the state of Florida versus George Zimmerman? Yes. And specifically, what were you provided uh, in regards to that case? Okay. So I was given um, a, whole, a whole series of um, things that I asked for the um, whatever is available because I'd like to do the consult, having as much as possible in the database before I um, formulated an opinion. So what I received was a reenactment of the incident involving the fatal shooting. This was recorded um, on the 27th of February, 2012. I got a set of 36 photographs taken of Mr. Zimmerman, documenting the clothing, the injuries, the medical records from the Altamont Family Practice Clinic. Um, and of course, there were two records from this clinic. One was on the 27th of February, and the other one was on the 9th of March, 2012. I got a DVD labeled Sanford PD Lobby and others. It showed the vehicle going to the police department and Mr. Zimmerman um, being taken by the police um, into the department to be booked. Um, a DVD labeled medical examiner report and photographs. And this included the medical examiner report the body diagrams, the autopsy photographs, 26 autopsy photographs were taken, the toxicology report, um, and then um, a report that uh, states um, two individuals were involved in a physical altercation in the yard, and one of them um, fired a handgun and the decedent um, fell to the ground caused injury. Whereas the sharp force is injury that is caused by a sharp weapon, a knife, a, a bottle that is broken and then the sharp edge used to inflict trauma. So this is the difference between sharp force and blunt force trauma. Within blunt force trauma, are there different types of blunt force trauma? Yes. And what are those? So the, um, the first part of it, let's, let's look at the progression of severity. A bruise, um, we're talking about a small bruise is where the skin is intact and the blood vessels under the skin are injured and they bleed under the skin and get what you <coughs> know as a bruise. The skin is intact. Then you have a scrape um, where the skin is compromised and it's, um, you know, for example, a rug burn would qualify as an abrasion. Then you have the lacerations where not only the skin is um, um, torn, but the underlying tissue is also torn, exposed to the outside, and depending on the severity of the laceration, you will get varying degrees of um, bleeding and trauma. All right. Are bruises also known as or referred to in your field as contusions? Yes. All right. And then scrapes is the same as a laceration? Abrasion. I'm sorry, abrasion. Yes. And then there's lacerations? Yes. Okay. Which is basically, laceration is a tearing of tissue. All right. 
have you ever been qualified in the courts of the state of Florida as an expert in the area of conducting rape examinations and all manner of injuries associated with rape victims? Yes. And again, approximately how many times? Hundreds of times. During your uh, tenure as the medical examiner in Miami, did you also examine other uh, categories or sets of living, living victims? Yes. And explain what you mean by that. So, um, for example, somebody alleging police brutality, the medical examiner, we just um, were housed directly across a very large hospital in Miami, Jackson Memorial Hospital. So the police would ask if we could go and examine um, to see if the allegations were actually borne out by the trauma. So we would go across the street, we would photograph, we would put out a report, and those reports come under consultations. Also child, and the other items in the same folder were the medical examiner autopsy report, the toxicology report. So this is what I received. Did you also receive two photographs of the defendant at the scene the night of the event? Yes. And when you said reenactment, when you referred to the reenactment, was that a, a, an interview where he conducted a walkthrough and, and led investigators through the scene and explained to him what happened? Yes. After reviewing all those items, in terms of severity, how would you classify the injuries to the defendant's head? They were not life-threatening. Uh, they were very insignificant. Uh, they did not require um, any sutures to be applied uh, to Mr. Zimmerman. Um, so, as I will refer to them, insignificant injuries. Did you observe any lacerations to the back of the defendant's head? Yes. How many? Two. And were those lacerations depicted in the photographs that you reviewed? Yes. They were, they, they were, there was bleeding, so I was not able to look at them after they were cleaned, because subsequently, when he went to the Altamont Clinic, they were um, covered by band-aids. And were you also um, provided the reports from the Altamont Family Springs Clinic uh, describing the injuries as they were viewed by a physician's assistant the next morning? Yes. Right. Yara, would you assist me with the lights? Dr. Rao, let me show you first, state 79. Was that one of the photographs from the scene that you were provided? Yes. And state 76, was that a photograph from the scene you were provided? Yes. Let me show you states 57, uh, where you also provided that photograph. Yes. All right. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? Yes, you may. Dr. Rao, let me give you this pointer. Um, let me just press that button. Yeah. If you would explain for the members of the jury where the lacerations are located um, that you observed and that were referred to in the uh, family clinic report. Okay, so we have one small injury right there. 